Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Yeah. Welcome to the Bitcoin Podcast. We in out chat. Bitcoins, we got them. Acquire, never sell. But catch us rolling deep like a Dell. Bitcoin, blockchains, cryptocurrency. Three guys faded talking Bitcoin, no fee. That's the free Bitcoin podcast, insane. And adoption is still the only thing, thing, thing that matters, man. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Bitcoin podcast, episode 131. I'm your first host, Marcello. And I'm host number two, Dimitric. Bringing up the rear, host number three, it's Corey. What's up, guys? What's up, you drunk hooligans? Not drunk yet. I am drunk. <laughs> I'm not there yet. <laughs> Working I'm on pretty, it. I'm toasty. Working Corey, you're not drinking it. whiskey? No, I'm out of whiskey. I drank it all. Uh, last weekend, or for Memorial Day, we had a Memorial Day bash last festival where I did a Brazilian Shohasco, and then we downed a bottle of apple pie moonshine, which is kind of like whiskey for me. So it's, I ran out. I was, that, more. was any of that in, in homage to some dead relatives? No, it was an homage to America and the sacrifices that went, that happened. I, I dropped a couple of pieces say, of meat on the ground. I'm glad you guys say homage. I was clowned the other day for saying homage. Somebody was like, why are you saying that? And I was like, that's how you say the word. What are they and saying? Homage? It got awkward. Yeah, homage. And I said, that's not right. That's wrong. <laughs> hey, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. Anyways, um... You know what's crazy about Memorial Day and drinking? And that's Athena Bitcoin. That's exactly where my brain went, too. It's funny you brought that up. (laughs) Episode 131 is brought to you by Athena Bitcoin each and every week, the most trusted name of Bitcoin ATMs. So if you're in Houston, Fort Worth, or Dallas, guess what? There's an ATM called Athena Bitcoin in your area, and we love it. They're also available in a bunch of other cities. Outside of Texas. Outside of Texas, yeah. Florida, definitely Florida. I think Chicago. Anywho, download the Athena Bitcoin wallet on the App Store or Google Play. For specific locations and more information, visit athenabitcoin.com because they're always adding new locations. And we're also brought to you in part by Athena Bitcoin's portfolio company, bitquick.co, which is a secure, quick, and easy peer-to-peer Bitcoin marketplace where you, the listener, can get Bitcoin for cash in as little as three hours. Bitquick has been serving Bitcoiners for a long time, four years. So where there's a bank, there's Bitquick. And today on the show, we got Mr. Ali. Munib Ali we, from Blockstack. Ahib Ali. And before we uh, interview him, we'll, you know how it goes, man. We're going to a round table. We're going to spitball a little bit. And then we're going to bring you that innovation goodness. You know, we never did. Yep. We never came up with a nice jingle for Bitquick or Athena Bitcoin. Well, I mean, would they want us to? I can, yeah, did I it, did I anybody ever up. want us to? Yeah, I think Josh, I think we did it once. And then Josh was like, I like it. Hold on. Let me see if I can do something. I'm going to channel my inner 1950s doo-wop. Athena Bitcoin. Is that good? No. That's good. That's a good jingle. Like, Cello said it was good. Corey, you say it was bad. Yeah. Cello's Cello the marketing guy. Cello's the marketing guy, so he wins. Got my back. Yeah, yeah, but you have to come up with two because there's Bitquick and then there's Athena Bitcoin. But we probably shouldn't figure this out right now. It's Bitquick. Get your bits quick. Ah, nailed it. Boom. I like that. Right. That's pretty good. I can see your face right now. You're like, that's actually pretty good. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I hope they take Anyways, that. Anyways, 
Yeah, that's a pretty good. It's bit quick. Get your bits quick. That's actually a pretty damn good jingle. That sounds too close to biz quick. The pancake mix. Well, sometimes or you gotta. Quick. Sometimes you gotta latch on. There's, there's a reason you have those things. What about um, like a rock, bit quick like a rock? No. <laughs> How about Athena Bitcoin? <laughs> when you're here, your family. Let's just merge or just a bunch of. Yeah. We merge all merge all the sponsors into one thing. Big quick, all a family. Just do it. Anyways, look, <laughs> just do it. Big quick, we'll get sued harder than we can imagine. No longer make the show. Anyway, all right. Uh, so like, let's get to some Bitcoin shit, right? Like, I have something I want to talk about. Is this about and your brother? Yes, this is about my brother. This is more so about Coinbase than it's about my brother, though. All right, so Coinbase, I have your back. I've been using your services for a long time. Dealt with the fees. Don't care. I'm a busy guy. I don't give a shit about fees. I just know I want the majority of my money to be in crypto. And Coinbase, you're the best service that I found to on-ramp people on, right? So I can I can say go to blockchain.info and let's sift through all this fucking advanced user stuff. And or I could say go to uh, Circle, which doesn't even do Bitcoin. Or I could say go to Airbits, which is like kind of okay, like they're making their way through it. But Coinbase is something that is very familiar to users. So my brother wants to buy some Ethereum. And I'm like, oh, Coinbase, they sell Ethereum. Go buy some from Coinbase. So he does buys a good amount. His damn ether has been floating in the ether for like 10 days. He's texting me on the daily. Hey, I got the email that it was going to be, it said it was initiated on this date. I'm supposed to get my ether on this date. And he hasn't got his ether. And it's been two days since the date that they said. Right? So I'm kind of pissed. It's getting real awkward for me. Every time I recommend somebody goes to Coinbase, I get this really awkward conversation where like, hey, like something went wrong. This has happened three of the last four times, Coinbase, right? So he tries to get on a customer service. Can't talk to a human. Talking to a robot. It looks like it's the Facebook Messenger. Yeah, just like that. Like you hear those noises when you type something into Coinbase. It's stupid. It looks like it's built on the Facebook Messenger API is what it looks like. It's stupid. Can't talk to a human. He's getting pissed off. I'm getting pissed off with him because I'm like, man, you dropped a lot of ducats on this ether, and it's not there. It doesn't say it's pending. It doesn't say anything. But it's gone from his bank. But it's gone from his bank, right? So, of course, it's gone from his bank. So, he reaches out and contacts support. And they send him a nice shiny email back with that Coinbase blue on it that says, it's going to be 72 hours, maybe, before we get back to talk to you about the thousands of dollars that are missing. So, Coinbase, if you're listening, which I know you're not, but maybe one of your employees is and they're going to pass it up. You need to get your shit together from a customer service standpoint because if people are going to be Spending thousands of dollars, maybe it doesn't even have to be thousands of dollars. People are spending money, period, and they can't contact anybody to figure out where the money is going. Then it leaves people like myself, Corey, and Cello in a really awkward position when we're trying to on ramp people, and there's no human they can talk to, and it's really awkward for us because they're like, "Hey, man, like I just dropped all this money and it's gone. It's just gone." So, I'm going to hop off my soapbox now. I just wanted to let... Have you guys had any other same experiences with Coinbase lately? Like, things just going awry and then it seems like they just don't give a fuck? So, last last uh, last week, when I was at Consensus, I was, uh, we went to see the Book of Mormon. My boss bought some tickets. He bought tickets for everybody. I was like, alright man, can I just pay you anything? He's like, yeah, that's cool. And I go, uh, all right, well, I'll send you some after the show. We get back to the hotel room. I was like, hey, man, uh, I'm going to send you that ether down. Just uh, send me a, send me a request, right? You, go, you, you can essentially send somebody a bill in Coinbase. So I pay it. Mm-hmm. 
and it sends it to him twice. It sends him about five hundred dollars in ether at the time, as opposed to two fifty. He's like, "Hey, you sent it to me twice." I was like, "I just clicked the, I just clicked the like fulfill order button." And mm. had that been somebody that wasn't my boss sitting next to me, that could have been a bitch. I'm gonna get that money back. And so he's like, "Well, I'll just send, it, I'll send you back to you." So he sends it back to me, and it sends it twice. Mm-hmm. So he sends me back the, the full amount that I gave him because he's trying to send me back the half of what I originally sent him, which was too much. Finally, the third time when I sent him back half of that, the original payment, it worked. I'm not terribly sure how any of that went down because I watched him click it once and I clicked it once. I don't know. It's it's. Like, is anybody not oh. experiencing growing pains in all of oh. the nonsense that's happening? In- I don't think anybody's not experiencing growing pains, but th- this is a specific call out in audience. I know you're listening. A specific call out to Coinbase in general that if we're trying to bring people on board to this new currency, new technology, then the avenue to onboard people should be a little bit more crisp than it is right now. And okay, you know, if I had an extra six hours in a day, I could really sit someone down and take them through a wallet service that's not Coinbase. Like, this is your own wallet, and there's no custodian of your wallet, and you hold your own funds and a hardware wallet, blah, blah, blah. I could take them through all of the different wallets. But people, the mass adoption, what everyone's trying to go for, they don't have that kind of time. They're like, it's just, how do I get my hands on some? And if they want to get their hands on some, the services they use are Coinbase. And what else? Am I? Because I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Airbits. You can buy Airbits. Well, Coinbase Air, for, for Bitcoin. That's the thing. Is like if you if people are want access to something other than Bitcoin, not nearly as easy if you don't go through Coinbase. You got to add about four other steps and explain a lot of infrastructure. On mm-hmm. why you have to do this before they're even remotely comfortable dropping that much money on something. For us, it's like, yeah, you just do that. It's like, this is the, these are the steps you have to go through, and it's it's it it's clear we're still really early in all this stuff, right? Because it's not easy. Yeah. This shit ain't easy. Is this a general customer service complaint that we could just apply to not just crypto? I mean, yeah, it's a general customer service complaint. Like, have a human for somebody to talk to. Look, I, Is that I, so hard? I recently signed up for the Dollar Shave Club, and um, you don't shave. That with, I trim, I trim. <laughs> so what, they do a good job. Uh, how they do it is, I think they remain like top of mind. They they stay in touch. So when someone for and you know you can adopt this to Coinbase or any other service. When someone first shows interest in you, if they sign up for a newsletter or they send a contact form request, their interest is high, and they're w- more willing to hear from you often, so that's when you capitalize. So when I went to the Dollar Shave Club, I put my email address in their opt-in form, and I got three emails that first week, and they were just saying hi. They were pointing out key features of the club. You know, They wooed me with their fun emails, and then they kept the sales process enjoyable and not annoying. And after that first week, they touched base with me a few days later, and then a week again after that point, so my point is like the key is to provide the information and reminders without being too pushy and find that good balance. You know, if I when I sign up for Coinbase, they don't send me emails. Brian Armstrong doesn't send me any touch points. It just seems like they forget about yeah. you and the customer service like, is just not there. So and you know, and it's also new. So they could provide high value information in each email. It just it keeps the communication simple and it honors the reader's time. They don't follow up. They don't get creative. They don't say hello. I mean, that's my big takeaway. So what about customer service, though? Like, I mean, it's, I feel like they're big enough. They should have quite a large dedicated team on dealing with people who have issues getting their money from their bank or credit card or debit card into into Coinbase. And I feel like, I mean, I, I personally haven't had those issues, but I've 
talked with plenty of people who do. Well, how do you, how do you do that? You just you just like grow your your customer support team, and that you don't think Coinbase is doing it. I, I just don't think they care. I mean, you can you can grow a customer service team, but if they don't care, you're just having more people that don't care. Yeah, they just that's need true. Better. They just they just need. I think they need to they need to go the extra mile and and. I don't know, man. Just There's a possibility care. that because I mean, they, they, uh, they recently tweeted that they on-ramped 40,000 people on a single day, right? That's, that's an absurd that's amount of on-ramping. More people than a stadium, right? Then they compare it to like San yeah. Francisco Giant that's, Stadium. Now, if they had, even if they had a really robust customer service problem, and you take like 1% of that, that's... That's a lot of that's a lot of customer service tickets hitting you hitting you all at once, and it it's everybody's having this issue because of this ridiculous price blow up that we saw, and everyone's trying to get in, and so everyone's trying to get in with like massive amounts of ignorance, right? They're asking us, they're asking their friends, they're they're googling some things, and they go like, "How do I get this money? How do I get into this before it blows up too much?" I yeah, to, everyone's I went, FOMO. I've been hearing about it for all this time, and I've been scared. And then all the stuff that you know we've been saying, my friends been saying, like your 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 token crypto nut and your friends has been talking about for the past three to four years. Oh shit, it's coming true. Yeah, and you're seeing all See, these people, the... uh, like between like twenty and thirty, becoming millionaires. You're like, fuck, I want I want to get in on this. And they're coming in with a very high amount of ignorance. And so the company that's the thing that go, go back to what Cello was talking about is yeah, there's a high level of ignorance, but Coinbase could be winning by oh, eliminating that ignorance. They could. they could. And keeping consistent and regular communication with the people that are more than happy to go spend a lot of money and the fees are ridiculous right now. Like just the fees might as well, like everything when it comes to the network and the congestion and how things aren't exactly playing out the way that we thought it would. Like Coinbase should be going out of their way. Like this is this is just one case with my brother. My father, who's buying Bitcoin on a regular basis now, is like, yo, why is Coinbase charging me two fees? And I had to sit him down and tell him, understand like, okay, well, there's a Coinbase fee and there's a Bitcoin network fee. They didn't that's, send Brian, you any... that's Brian Armstrong's job. That's Actually, Brian Armstrong's job as a CEO. You're absolutely right. Keep going, Cello. No, it's. I mean, yeah, you should. You were doing his his job. Yeah, I'm doing Coinbase's job for them by sitting my dad down and saying, "Okay, this is why that happened." I bet you won't sponsor us, Coinbase. I bet you won't. <laughs> Not now. <laughs> <laughs> What did you guys say? I didn't hear what you said. No, no, they're they're not going to sponsor us. Um, uh, let's uh, let's let's move to the uh, let's move to the interview, which has nothing to do with Coinbase whatsoever. We're talking about building yeah. the new internet. New internet. Okay. Okay. Wait. In uh, in, in a very user friendly way, right? Now. Everybody is saying that I'm building the new internet. Like it seems a little bit fishy at this point. In time. Well, I told you, man. That, that's my pet peeve too, man. This so that that is what's happening, right? And it's, it's 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 based on the on the infrastructure, like how the computers are linked together to then serve information to the people, and how the data that's put on this network re- resides. Okay, and it's based on so, the client server model. All information lives on servers, and that's how the internet, as we use it now, currently works. The new internet, which is vis-a-vis blockchain however that ends up happening the data doesn't live that way and so how you interact with it and how you interact with the people and the applications you've used that make your lives more convenient is fundamentally different and when they say we're building the new internet that's what they're referring to now whether or not they're going to be able to do that we'll see i mean blockstack does a pretty good job of being agnostic i think what they're doing is is at least Novel and noteworthy, but what actually ends up happening? Okay. Who knows? Thank you for specifying that because whenever I hear somebody talking and there's people standing, they're standing up talking in front of a very glorious PowerPoint presentation, and they always end up saying, 
we're rebuilding the internet in a very Keanu Reevesy kind of voice, and I'm just like, you're bullshit. And so, thank you for specifying. But that's anyways, what they're, that's what they're referring to. So we all have this kind of push, what we're trying to build, and it's going to be a while until they get there. But the idea is to change the client server model into a decentralized model, and how which allows the users to have control over their own information, as opposed to living on someone else's server and asking that server for my own information. Now, however that manifests itself, blockchain allows for it, but how it actually ends up working for the mass adoption, who knows? Because guess what? The client-server model is really convenient, and the internet is really convenient. And we're not going to have mass adoption until we match that convenience. Hey, well, the, I want to say you should you should also turn one fan off because the enormous power of two fans is blowing dishes all over your kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> For the listeners, you can't see our screen. D is sitting in a room. He calls it a big room, but there's two very large fans sitting right next to each other, just blowing on his face. Room. The big room, and just dishes are flying all it's over like, the place. Like. So- can you guys? You guys can hear that. Everybody can hear that. Okay. All right. Well, let's get to the interview. It's Block Stack. Here it is. All right. Today we have Muni Bali on the show on the Bitcoin Podcast. Why don't you go ahead and uh, give our audience a quick introduction of who you are and how you got started into the, the blockchain space in general. Hey, hey everyone, uh, this is Munib. I'm a co-founder of Blockstack with Ryan Che. And my background is basically uh, distributed systems. I recently did a PhD uh, in computer science and I've been studying like all sorts of like different distributed systems and computer networks over the last decade. Uh, we got interested in blockchains because uh, it solves a fundamental computer science problem. Uh, the the decentralized consensus problem. And we've been looking at how some of these technologies can actually be used to build a new internet stack. Like imagine, uh, you know, the current internet infrastructure has been around for like 30, 40 years, uh, but we can actually utilize some of the the innovations in blockchains to actually have a different second internet uh, that actually puts users more in control. Uh, instead of like relying on 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 big companies like Facebook or Google, that's something interesting that I've always kind of appreciated about um, the message I'll try and put out and what you've been trying to build is that you've you've been somewhat agnostic to the types of stacks that people can build with, and you've gone kind of you've almost abstracted away how all of this fits together, and and potentially given people a chance to build their own back end, if you will. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I think when, when you're thinking about like internet architecture, and even if you look at the, the original internet architecture, I think one of the key things that they got right was these layers of abstraction, right? Like if uh, like there's this term in, in um, computer networking circles that uh, TCP IP acted as like a narrow waist for the internet. Like, and it's a narrow waist in the sense that I imagine uh, that as long as that layer of abstraction stays there, things can evolve underneath. So imagine how we used to have like Ethernet, but then Wi-Fi came along, but we didn't need to do anything, right? The internet kind of like just kept working. Like similarly, things can evolve on top of TCP IP as well. And, um, and, and it's very seamless, right? So defining some of these like right abstractions uh, is, is part science and part art. And we've been like very obsessed with this uh, from day one with, with Blockstack. So we, we actually want to make sure that um, people can develop applications in languages that they are already comfortable with. Uh, a large number of developers out there just use JavaScript and uh, we don't want them to learn something new like a new language uh, in which you, you program your decentralized applications. Uh, and so that was one goal. We also went a step further where 
we don't want to be tied down to any particular blockchain either, right? Like, so we, we figured out that there is this property uh, known as like total ordering of operations. And most blockchains, all blockchains actually have that property. Uh, and as long as like that is the interface that we require from the blockchain there, we can actually build uh, build our technology on top and, and keep it generic so that if a blockchain underneath fails, we can migrate over to something else. And that actually helped us a lot because we were operating on a smaller blockchain called Namecoin earlier and actually di uh, discovered some security issues there and did a migration on top of Bitcoin. But you can imagine like if Bitcoin uh, is, is having issues with, with transactions, fees, fees being too high or something else goes wrong, it's completely possible for us to do a seamless migration somewhere else. So we, we try to be like uh, agnostic of specific technologies wherever we can. Uh, and, and I can like go into more details about uh, specifically how it works for like developers and how they can, they can uh, pretty much like plug in uh, things that they like or already use uh, and, and, and use it with, with our stack. As an example of that, I guess, um, you recently did um, a panel at Token Summit, which I, I was watching. I was also at your, your uh, release of Consensus, which we'll, we'll get to as well. But uh, in regards to what you're talking about here with allowing the end user to plug in, quote unquote, what they would like to use. Um, I've been playing with your dev release of your, your browser, which allows you to, well, potentially... Right now, it allows you to connect your Dropbox. It has options for Drive. I'm assuming you have you know, IPFS, all the different storage options. So the panel you did at Token Summit was discussing all of the different network protocols that are dealing with decentralized storage. And eventually, those will all be options that people can plug in using the, 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 the block stack uh, web browser. Is that is that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so basically, um, the... The approach that we take to like decentralized storage, which is a core component of like any uh, decentralized uh, systems project or, or a decentralized internet project, uh, the approach that we take is we we are aiming for really high performance and reliability because we believe that if users are not going to get kind of like the performance that they get from uh, existing cloud providers or the kind of reliability that they get from existing cloud providers, uh, they are not going to actually switch over to, to the decentralized internet, right? So we designed our system in a way where you can uh, plug in existing storage providers like Dropbox or, or G Drive, or even if you're running like Linux servers on, um, on, in a data center somewhere, you can actually just plug it in and um, and and use it. So so it's like it's very seamless. And the system that we have designed is it abstracts away kind of like the, like these different differences in those storage systems. So imagine that how uh, hard drives have like drivers, mm -hmm. uh, but people it's very seamless. Like you don't even know who's the manufacturer of your hard drive uh, because there are these drivers and all hard drives just kind of like work with your computer. And, and, and 20 years ago, you would actually, like if you're using Linux, you would have to go and actually find the driver and play around with it before you got like a new hard drive or, or, or like a sound card to work with your system, right? But now these days, like you don't even think about it. So similarly, like cloud providers these days are kind of like, they're trying to differentiate themselves from each other. Dropbox has a different API. Uh, Google has a different API. But we're reducing them to like these commodity uh, cloud storage and we are saying that we will treat you as like just uh, commodity storage and we will put encrypted data on 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 these drives so Dropbox has no visibility into the data uh, Google has no visibility and and we have a common like uh, wide area file system uh, that's called Gaia and as long as there is a driver for the underlying provider and it could also be for other uh, decentralized storage systems like IPFS um, or, or, or storage. Uh, in fact, like we, at, you mentioned the token summit. At the token summit, we announced how we have uh, bounties on on GitHub, 
mm-hmm. uh, for writing these drivers. And within a day, actually, we started getting pull requests where people were submitting drivers to actually claim those bounties, and that was, that was pretty cool. Yeah, it was uh, maybe a bit of a philosophical shift here, but something I I've been talking about quite a bit or like been thinking about and trying to form is is I think the way the internet was created as we use it today is based on this client server model infrastructure which requires you to store information on a central server. So when you build applications on such an infrastructure, you tend towards companies and applications that store all of your information you don't have access to. Which now that's exactly what we have. We have these giant conglomerates like Facebook, Google, Dropbox, so on and so forth that do this. And because of that, and the convenience that it gives us in our everyday lives, we we we've created these monsters. But the decentralized internet, the something you're trying to build, is built on a completely new archi- ar- architecture or infrastructure, which we can now start to maybe build applications on which can have vast implications on how we communicate, how we interact with the applications we deal with and so on and so forth. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. I would actually like, I think the client server model is a really good analogy and I'll, I'll, I'll discuss that in a bit, but I'll, I'll go a step further, right? Like if you, if you go back enough in computing, you would notice that in the early days we would have like these mainframe computers mm-hmm. and you would have these really dumb terminals uh, connected to the mainframe, right? And all the computation was actually happening on the mainframe and the terminals was, they were just screens and with the keyboard. Mm-hmm. And, and once like, you know, desktop computers started getting more and more powerful, we saw this pendulum swing where, uh, these des- desktops became very powerful. And we went through an era where, you know, you would install software from like these CD-ROM drives directly on your computer. And you would do most of the things on your computer. Right? And then we start saw like this pendulum swing back to the cloud where the, the, the data centers were becoming so much more powerful that we started pushing all these computation and storage uh, back to the data centers, right? And, and in a way, like our laptops really became very similar to those early dumb terminals where it's just a screen and a keyboard and you're constantly talking to something that is running on a server at Facebook or a server at Google or a server uh, at Amazon. Right. So, so that has like a lot of security implications. That has a lot of uh, ownership implications because all of your data is now with another company or you are uh, relying on another company or a remote server somewhere. That's where the client server model comes in for the correct execution of your application. Right? Uh, it's, it's not running locally on your device anymore. Um, and what we are basically now seeing is that the, our devices, like even our, our mobile devices, they're like so powerful uh, that you can actually run apps locally here. Your your desktop is so powerful that you can actually run a lot of lo- logic just as like a completely front-end JavaScript app. Uh, but we are still moving away from uh, cloud computing in a way where people are realizing that I want ownership of all, all my data I, because there are all these security problems where these companies get hacked and all of this data is, is hacked uh, from them, like what happened with Yahoo and, and the 500 million people who lost their information uh, from Yahoo. And so our infrastructure basically tries to take the best of both worlds where we are saying that we will try to run most of the computations locally. So the apps are installed locally on your device and we will repurpose existing data centers in a way that um, we put encrypted data on, on, on them and users have explicit control over their data and they can actually use, replicate their data across multiple providers because if you look at the comparison between like CPU, memory and disk, disk is by far the cheapest thing in computing. And it mm-hmm. keeps getting ch- cheaper o- over time, right? So we can actually still get like cloud performance in a decentralized web because your data is actually physically still in a data center somewhere, but maybe uh, on a Linux server that you're running or maybe uh, with Dropbox, but Dropbox has like, there's nothing Dropbox can do to that data because of the software uh, that Blockstack provides and the drivers that we have written. 
So do you see almost like um, all the devices that we use, even despite the fact that they have tremendous power compared to a few years back, just becoming glorified like keychains? Uh, I, I think it can actually happen that uh, basically ownership of your private keys and the devices that have access to it are, are going to become like one of the most important things as we move forward and more um, more assets or more more digital assets are actually owned by these these private keys mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's that's kind of like where block stack fits in as well where uh, other than our browser, I think we we made an announcement about our block stack token as well. But we basically focus more on the technology and not on on the token that much. But if you think about the token uh, in Bitcoin, the token is actually uh, payment, right? It's money that you are sending from one person to another, and the token is the payment. On Ethereum, the token is computation. So the token is your right to run certain computation on all nodes uh, in Ethereum. I mean, that has scalability issues, but that's a different uh, story. Uh, in, in Blockstack, the token is actually used for registering digital property. And that digital property might be a domain name that you directly register, or it could be like a software package that you want to release and you want to publish, or it could be a license to using a software and someone like registers that. But it's all about data and just ownership of data and assets uh, in, in forms of digital property. Uh, this is something that our entire network is built around, uh, the concept of like digital property and then using the token um, as a mechanism for spam protection or, or access control to this decentralized network. Yeah, well, it's a good way to think about or what I try to convince people to think about when they think about tokens is blockchain allowed us to create digital scarcity. And you can manifest digital scarcity in many different ways where, like, say, for instance, um, what you're doing is is the scarcity involved is the namespace of the Internet you're trying to go to with yep. uh, with, uh, like, say, the recent um, basic attention token. The scarcity is people's actual attention on the Internet in whatever way that forms. But the, the back end of these tokens um, is very is very different. Like Bitcoin's token is the Bitcoin network. Ethereum is the underlying computational token of the Ethereum network. And then we have all of these other tokens built on top of Ethereum. And I and Blockstack or Blockstack's token is going to be quite different than all of these as well. Can you one explain how that token is minted and, and kind of lives, as well as um, how you perceive the end user understanding the discrepancies between these things. Yeah, absolutely. So f first of all, I completely agree that, you know, the the scarcity is the key thing here. Uh, and in a way, you can think of this uh, as if you are Facebook, Facebook is the gatekeeper, right? So Facebook can actually uh, manage resources. But mm -hmm. if you have a decentralized network and you don't have scarcity or some sort of access control, then you're just opening up your network to all types of like spammers or more specifically uh, civil attacks where you know people can just like completely take over uh, your network. And the token is, is the innovation that basically enables access control without having some sort of a central gatekeeper. Right? And it's a fully decentralized system, but, but still has protection that, that, that people can just attack the network and, and just make it useless for, for other people. So I completely agree there. That's the main use case for tokens. For us specifically, uh, one thing that we've been uh, working on and we actually released uh, last year in, in a, in a peer-reviewed paper uh, is, is our virtual chain. So I think the best way to think about that is think about the virtualization technology in general, mm -hmm. which is extremely popular in data centers. And basically what that does is that all of your services and apps running in data centers, they're almost never running on the actual physical machine. Right? The virtual machine is kind of like the software that pretends to be the hardware for all the applications. And the apps are running on the VMs and the VMs are running on the physical machine. So if the physical machine, something goes wrong with it, uh, it's very seamless to migrate the virtual machine to another physical machine, and most people won't even notice, right? If a Google server crashes, like 
that error is never uh, would never impact like a user or some sort of a thing running yeah. on top of it, right? So that's the isolation and fault tolerance layer. And we brought that technology to blockchains where we clearly defined, I, I, I mentioned this earlier, this notion of total ordering of operations. Uh, so in distributed systems, if you can give guarantees on total ordering of operation, you can actually uh, reason about uh, correctness properties of like systems built on top. So if we say that blockchains are very dumb uh, uh, network as a very dumb layer. The only thing it does, it, it basically sequences operations and that's it. And we store minimal amount of data there, right? And again, that's very important for scalability. And then we introduce like our, our virtualization uh, uh, layer on top. And we actually built like full fledged blockchains or even another way to think about that is state machines. So okay. we can have like a full state machine on top that just processes these ordered operations and you can build any system because once you have a state machine, you can pretty much build any system on top. Uh, so the so the state machine that we have rolled out in, in, in our blockchain uh, basically builds out this entire system of name registrations, ownership mappings, public key associations with these names and, and in general like uh, property rights that I was talking about. So what, what that allows us to do is uh, as I mentioned earlier, that if the underlying blockchain fails, uh, we can actually protect the rest of the networking stack from the network failure. And 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 uh, one way to think about this is that it's too early to decide like what blockchains are going to succeed, like five years from now or ten years from now. But yeah. if you're build, building like an entire internet on top of this technology, then that network has to survive for hundreds of years, and and we it can't just die if the underlying blockchain if something happens to the underlying blockchain. So that's what we're trying to do. And we uh, actually plan to release more details about our new mining system uh, that is there for these uh, uh, for these virtual chains, uh, the virtualization that uses the virtualization technology. But we can have a mining system there as well that is decoupled from, from the underlying blockchain. So the token actually exists in, in, in this layer uh, on top. And we plan to actually publish uh, more details on that in, in the coming months. When you say publish, I have I've I've gone through the the uh, peer reviewed publishing bonanza that is academia before, and a good portion of kind of how you publish, uh, for those that don't know, is choosing the journal in which you'd like to publish in, which is heavily differentiated by the specialization of what you're publishing. How in the world do you choose something to publish in uh, in a peer-reviewed way for something like this? Because the academic setting for blockchains is is pretty thin outside of like IC3. Yeah, yeah ab absolutely. I, I think I couldn't agree more uh, that the the general distributed systems community is not fully engaged with this topic right now. Uh, I, I think... Uh, I think Gunzer published in a top networking conference like NSDI in 2016, and then we published at a top like uh, networking conference called Usenex uh, in 2016 as well. And I'm not actually aware of other papers appearing at least in like in distributed system conferences. I think from what I've heard from Andrew Miller, uh, things are a little bit better in the applied crypto space where conferences mm -hmm. are now having tracks on blockchains and people are more receptive to this technology, but at least in the distributed system space, like clearly it's very hard to <clears throat> find a good venue uh, that would actually accept this. But with that said, I think there is actually a lot of value uh, in peer review. And this is something that actually we've been very careful with. If you notice like our papers, three of them are like peer reviewed. And then there's one white paper that is actually written in a way that is for a broader audience. And then that paper is also uh, kept updated as as we learn from our production system, we uh, update certain things, and, and and that white paper is like constantly updated. Uh, but I do think there's a lot of value in going to uh, these communities of experts and actually trying to get feedback from them because they have seen similar systems before, like similar technologies have existed before, right? Like it's it's actually possible to explain blockchains to people as as a, a, a as a replicated log 
mm -hmm. right? And then and then then look at like the works people have done in log structured file systems, or like and there there are similarities. There are many or there are many lessons that people learn uh, in in the first wave of peer to peer networks uh, when all these these networks like Napster uh, started with Spark, and then there were there were researchers who were publishing papers, building real systems. And, and that entire interest kind of like died off by like 2006, 2007. And a lot of the same community uh, started working on data centers and started working for these large corporations. But now there is kind of like interest again in these decentralized peer-to-peer -peer networks. And I think it would be extremely valuable to re-engage that community, to re-engage those experts and not make the same mistakes. So I think we understand that it's hard to publish papers uh, in this area, but I think we kind of like go out of our way to still try and get those peer reviews and then get certain things published. And when in in the interest of time, or if we can't find a good venue, we would actually put that information in a white paper uh, like we did. So now that we've kind of covered the uh, almost underdeveloped side of blockchain, how about we take a stab at our at the, at the somewhat overdeveloped side of blockchain and, and these these crazy ICOs that are happening now and how you fit into those. I mean, we're it's, we're going to see a proliferation of of tokens come and with with a with a myriad of of actual legitimacy coming out of them. H how do you Renna, you have quite the bill quite, quite the bit of legitimacy already built into Blockstack because one you have a working prototype Two, you've been around for a while and it, you have, I guess, a very good team behind you that says you're probably capable of putting these things out. But how do you differ differentiate yourself and where do you see this kind of crazy hype train going where you have very, very short length ICOs creating a significant amount of money, probably not from the people who are ever going to use the platforms putting them out? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. There, there's a lot of excitement in this area, but clearly it's like the wild west as well, where you know a lot of people cannot differentiate between projects. Like, imagine that if if people are putting up white papers, like these days now, if you actually quote try unquote. To, yeah, quote unquote, right? Because if you open the white paper, it's actually just a distribution plan for how the token is going to get distributed right like if the, that the, 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 <laughs> the, the, the technology piece like keeps getting smaller right in in in, in white papers and then another thing is that um, I think like ethereum has enabled people to very easily create these new tokens mm -hmm. I think one of their one of, one of their initial examples for like how to like start programming on Ethereum or something. I think once I was br browsing around was how, how to create a new token, right? So now imagine that if you're a newbie developer, uh, like like a newbie JavaScript developer, and you don't understand like how distributed systems work or how the blockchains work or how, 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 like what they're getting into, like they're still able to create a token, right? And and if they think that they can actually raise a lot of money using that as well, and I'm not going to comment on any of the regular regulation problems mm -hmm. uh, concerning this, but clearly like people need to be extremely careful uh, with, with what they're doing. And, and I think that's creating this market where I believe most of the tokens are actually on top of Ethereum. And anytime you talk to a developer uh, and you basically try to poke around a little bit and ask them questions like, um, let's, let's take an example of like, uh, an app that said, you know, I'm building, I don't want to pick on a project. Yeah. <laughs> Try, trying to right. find a nice, take healthy a, way to do this. Yeah. Like, like imagine like any service where they're saying that, Hey, there's going to be a smart contract. And then the user will send a transaction to the smart contract. I'm like, great. Uh, do you expect to get a million users? And they're like, yeah, at least or more. And then, okay. So, you're going to send a million transactions to your smart contract. Do you know how long it is going to clog the Ethereum network? And they, they don't know. And when you tell them that the figure is actually in the order of weeks to maybe months, uh, they're shocked, right? So they, people don't even have like a basic understanding of how Ethereum works or what are the different design decisions that they have explicitly taken and they, I think, publicly defend. Uh, one of them is remote code execution. So you are actually running untrusted code 
on on your on your on your node uh, if you're if you're running an Ethereum node. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that a lot of developers in this space fully understand like what that means, what kind of security problems you're you're opening yourself to, or what kind of scalability bottlenecks there are. So I do think that the in, in in the long run, when it's not just prototypes, it's not just like quote unquote white papers, when actually people do start building production systems, they're going to hit a lot of problems that we were hitting like three years ago or, or two years ago. Uh, uh, same thing for peer networks, right? Like we, once you actually start running large peer networks, you start noticing uh, a churn problem, for example, if a lot of nodes are in, are joining your structured network and then exiting your structured network and your network now re needs to reconfigure uh, for to adapt to that change. And when, once the rate of that change actually goes above a certain threshold, what happens, right? So then there's entire body of work on like structured peer-to-peer -peer systems versus unstructured peer-to-peer -peer systems. And if you look at all these projects right now, they're basically using the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. And all of them uh, uh, have similar problems, which they're going to hit uh, sooner or later, right? So I do think that in general, the technology piece in in our entire industry is actually very very frothy, and we need more uh, more experts to move in. Like I would feel a lot better if people who have actually built large scale distributed systems. Like imagine I was talking to a friend of mine who's working at, on the Spanner team at Google. Like imagine the actual storage system that Google runs and actually yep. scales out. To, to, to billions of people, like if those people are actually working on this technology, I would feel a lot better that, that uh, it's getting properly vetted. They, uh, the technology is actually attracting some serious uh, traction. And, and, and on the flip side, like if some of these projects actually start going bust, honestly, I don't think it's a bad thing. Right? No. Like if, if like people, I'm sure that investors would learn from experiences and maybe some sort of metrics would develop around like what kind of things to look for because these are not professional investors these are not vcs they have never invested before they don't they've never been burned before uh, uh so i think like right now we are kind of like in the honeymoon phase of all of this and and it's attracting a lot of attraction and even if i personally dislike it uh, it might actually be a good thing for the the benefit of, of the long run of the ecosystem because I think I'm, I made a comment at the token summit as well that maybe uh, once the market crashes a bit, like through the ashes of uh, some of these projects, we will actually see like sustainable things uh, grow out of it, which of which will completely revolutionize the the world. So I'm actually actually very bullish on the technology in the long run. Uh, I'm just like very concerned about what's happening in the, in the short run. I couldn't agree anymore. And like something that I think it was either you or Ryan said on the stage at Consensus was um, talking about Google's motto. We go back to them, you know, don't be evil. And yeah. they said a better model is can't be evil and designing systems yeah. that don't allow the people who created the system to take complete control over it or give them the choice to not take control over it it's better to design yeah. a system that just doesn't even have that option available yeah that was the that was me and the the funny story there is that my wife actually works at google <laughs> <laughs> well i mean that's that's one of the reasons why i appreciated them in the first place is that they took that stance but i think we can yeah. all agree it's that the, it's, it's, the, it's the next evolution right like it's exactly. not that, that that was bad that was good at the time but like i think it's the next evolution like where do we go from there well how, how does how does the decentralized web solve that problem? I think it's it's basically where, <clears throat> so this uh, I think like connects back to some of the design of the original internet as well. Like, mm -hmm. like uh, the, the, the chief pro protocol architect, uh, this researcher, David Clark at MIT, like he basically was really pushing people to follow this design principle <clears throat> uh, called the end-to-end -end design principle where the core of the network is very simple and most of the complexity is at the edges, right? So <clears throat> the, the internet basically delivers packets like dumb data. It doesn't even know what that data is. 
And over time, like uh, David Clark in the last decade or so has been reflecting upon like what went right and what went wrong with, with the internet. And he's kind of like evolved his end-to-end -end design principle into he's calling the trust to trust design principle. And, and where he, he's saying that uh, we were not explicit enough about trust, that we were explicit about complexity. There's no complexity in the middle, but we were not explicit enough about trust. And we do trust things in the middle of the network. Like imagine when, whenever you go to CNN.com, there's some random server that you don't even know where is that server that is saying the IP address of CNN is this, and you just like trust that. Mm -hmm. Or if you go to facebook.com, uh, there's usually this one company or like some computer owned by that company that is saying, yes, this is the right security certificate for Facebook. You're talking to the right Facebook. And we just trust that. We don't even know like what, what all is happening. And, and same with like data that let's say you're using a third party application and both you and your friend are, let's say, trying to collaborate on that app. That app could be giving different views to one user and the other. But nobody, nobody even thinks about it. They're like, yes, I just blindly trust this third-party app. Uh, it's doing its job correctly, and we both want to use this app, right? So this, this, this thing about slowly, uh, after like many problems and many bad things happening, uh, people are realizing that they need to be very explicit about trust. That hey, I only trust my computer, or I only trust my computer and my uh, router but I don't trust anything in the rest of the network, right? So how do you now remodel uh, the, the internet infrastructure and, and also all the apps that are being built where these trust relations are very explicit? And I think that's something that people are learning from, uh, from real systems like Bitcoin, where it's very clear that if you own Bitcoins directly on your private key or are your Bitcoins are in an exchange, Right. And if that yep. exchange goes away, your, your money also goes away. Or if you're running your own Bitcoin node and you don't trust anything else, or are you trying to talk to a remote node and you're trusting that node with the information that you're getting? Right. So with, with these, these, with blockchains and these systems, there's a lot of financial interest in building these systems and designing them in a way where the trust relationships are very explicit. And that's what we have done at Blockstack, right? Like you can think of Blockstack as an implementation of an internet that follows the trust to trust design principle. And whenever you do like a lookup of domains or of public keys or of uh, data that you just fetched somewhere, um, all the verifications are done in an environment that you trust. It's like either your local machine or a server that you are running uh, on devices that you own. Well, hell yeah, that's a, quite a quite an explanation of, I think, the, the point of what all of us are trying to do and how um, what you guys have been doing for the past couple of years is, is moving towards that unified goal. I mean, we've all kind of had this ideology in our head of decentralizing the internet, but people are trying to do it in various ways. And I think a lot of people are failing quite a bit at it, um, but not y'all in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a hard problem, right? Like, so yeah, well, I don't it's think definitely there, hard. <laughs> there, 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 I don't think there should be an expectation of success. I, I think that that's another thing that um, this, the second point uh, that I would bring up about the interest in these tokens and all these systems is that I think in all the excitement, people are forgetting that traditional distributed systems are hard enough to build when you add this additional complexity that no single party can be in control, things actually become more complicated, right? So it will take a long time and a lot of like uh, real world trial and error and experiences before we get to a stage where this technology is like as widely used as the earlier versions, right? And, and it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, the, it's, it's a huge revolution, but it's, it's, it's a marathon and people should like pace themselves accordingly. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. All right. Um, that's a great place to kind of wrap, start wrapping this up. Is there anything that you would like our listeners to know about where to get a hold of you, where to find out more, what to expect? Yeah. So, uh, I, I'm on Twitter, uh, at Muneeb, M-U-N-E-E-B. 
Uh, but the best place to actually find information on Blockstack is our website. Uh, it's blockstack.org. Again, it's like a block stack, like a stack of blocks, dot org. And we have all of our developer documentation, our research papers, our, our white papers there. And, and, and we actually have an open source community. Uh, so you can hop into our GitHub or our chat channels and, and just say hi there. And our last question we tend to ask everyone. Um, can you explain blockchain in 10 words or less? 10 words. Wow, that's a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that tends to be the, the, the response we get. Uh, so, a, a technology that enables computers to work together without electing leaders. Nailed it. 10 words on the on the dot. Oh, awesome. <laughs> I, I, I didn't count, actually, but I was hoping to go <laughs> um, a little over. You're making me nervous there. <laughs> All right, Medium. Thanks for coming on the show. We appreciate having you. All right. Awesome. This was fun. Yeah. Take care. Bye. And that was Blockstack. That was the interview with Blockstack. Hope you enjoyed it. We really do. They're rebuilding the internet. It's going to be a brand new day. It's good. We've got a new horizon of the internet coming our way. How excited are you on a scale of 1 to 10 about that? Ah, uh, You know, I just got to be honest from my heart. And whenever somebody says, I'm rebuilding the internet, I immediately go to negative 1.5. Well, actually, on a scale of 1 to 10, negative 1.5 is like a 5. So I go to like a, go to like a 3. I feel like the guy who should rebuild the internet is the guy who built the internet. Where's he? Where's he at? What's he doing nowadays? Who, Al Gore. He's busy making the second uh -huh. inconvenient truth. <laughs> this oh, one's priorities. called. An, yeah, this one's called an inconvenient lie. What? Sure. It's just gonna be a lot yeah. of Trump. Yeah, it's just gonna be like. I think you could actually make a pretty viable movie that would sell a lot if it were just clips of Donald Trump. No. Just giving neurotic handshakes to people. Yeah. We're not we're Insane. not we're not we're not moving this direction. This is not what we're talking about. It's, okay, yeah, we're not gonna go there. Um what we actually want to talk about for you guys listening is the concept of a bubble. Right, because you're gonna hear this word thirty thousand times throughout the next ten years when Bitcoin is becoming uber valuable, and so is Ethereum, and so is Litecoin, and all cryptocurrencies becoming really valuable. There's gonna be a lot now. Bubble is not a negative word; mm. it's just a word that's thrown around. Well, it's negative. It's got negative connotations now because of what happened in 2008. A bubble is right? what happens when something isn't working the way it should work. Because of like too much exuberance. I thought that was a bust. A bust is what happens when you you the dealer gets okay. hit too many times. If I could, if I can make it succinct, I think a bubble is artificial growth. Yep, artificial that's, that's nails it. Growth, right? Nails it. But when people are talking about Bitcoin and saying that it's experiencing a bubble, we can't make that argument anymore. And I hate when people try to, because it's not artificial growth. If it were artificial growth, then it wouldn't repeat that pattern. But Bitcoin has gone through the same pattern over and over and over and over again. You're making anything, it black and white. Not... You're making it black and white. It's it, it's the amount of artificial growth relative to the total growth that makes that makes a bubble significant. Right? Like, okay, so Keep going. So if you have, if let's say we live in a dream world where mm -hmm. everyone who's buying Bitcoin right now is buying it because they want to use it. The demand for Bitcoin perfectly matches the supply of Bitcoin, which is going to give you the perfect price of what a Bitcoin should be worth. Because the people who want to use the network are buying the token from the people who are willing to sell it. That's 
probably the perfect price evaluation, whatever that ends up being. Then if you have another group of people who are saying, this is going to be huge in the future, I'm going to buy it now. I'm going to buy a ton of it now. And I'm going to sit on it because people are going to use this one day. Is that the point? Is that the point of Bitcoin? So when you think, think about that... these two two groups of people relative to each other, if everyone is just trying to buy it and holding it, then the amount of Bitcoin that's actually circulating in the network gets smaller and smaller and smaller, which makes the price go up and up and up. Because people keep wanting to buy it, and the amount that's available to buy keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Because of that, People are willing to buy it for more and more and more because it's harder to find. That's a bubble because no one's using it for what its purpose is. But we still haven't defined that purpose. Oh, well, get into it. You just say get into it? Yeah, get into it. Define what a bubble is. We didn't just experience a Bitcoin bubble. It was a it was a cryptocurrency bubble. Well, that's for the same exact same reason. It's 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 speculation and not use case. Like all of these these millions of dollars that are being made on these ICOs, none of them are because people want to buy the token to use it whatsoever. They only want to buy these tokens so they can hold a good percentage of it to either manipulate that market or sell it for a profit for the people who may eventually want to use that token. And so if they can control the scarcity of that network, they can control the price of it and make a significant amount of money. Nobody gives a shit about what the token is for. They're only trying to make money off of it. It wasn't all speculation, though. Those are some facts that came Ooh, out of them. So if that's the case, then if that becomes something that is generally known, like if that becomes common sense, like, oh, these ICOs, people are just gobbling them up so they can control the supply, and therefore all the demand comes straight to them, then who's going to want to use that damn token? Well, if, if it offers a really good service at some point, then... I'm not going to pay exorbitant amounts of money just to use a really good service if I can just get a network that's really, really big that does the services already yep so there's then they're just gonna have to bleed off those tokens they bought and they may or may not make a may or may not make a percentage off of them but based on what's going on in the icos oh that's the issue you've automatically included economics and game theory with including a token into what you're doing if there's a token on your platform and it's worth a certain amount of money there's game theory associated with it, and people are going to try and do whatever they can to take advantage yeah. of it to make money. Period. You that's cannot stop think, those people. That's where I think there's a, there's two kinds of people in cryptocurrency to begin with, and that's people that think this is a zero-sum game and people that don't. And that's where we are right now. You are about to and say I something, Chad. Like what were you about to say? Um, well, you were talking about speculation, but, uh, the fact is that other cryptos, including Ethereum, which is Bitcoin's strongest competitor, it dropped relative to Bitcoin. So that proves that Bitcoin is still the market leader. And we learned that from the recent bubble. So there's takeaways that aren't just purely speculation. You know, you can, you can learn things from this. True. It's a good, how much how much this the markets are like kind of relative to each other, but it's it's still like who's using the amount of people who are in who own crypto, who's using those crypto? Like let's we'll take Ethereum because Ethereum has a really good use case. It's for paying for smart contracts and ex, smart, smart contract execution. We're, running, we're gonna keep running into this problem though because people don't give a shit about this is this is what I'm saying is like. Nobody's making this stuff cool like they need to be. People are only saying, I'm making millions of dollars. 
Like, is is that is that the is? I, I, you're right. Yeah. Nobody's making this stuff cool. Nobody's saying, "Look what you can do with this. Look, look, look at the things that you can do." It's all just look at how much money we're making over here in crypto land. I think anyone we're who gonna... actually in, in like look at the people who invest in corn. They don't know anything about corn. That someone puts fifty million dollars into this year's crop wouldn't know what potential problems there might be with corn or the expected returns from the crops because they're like trader types. You know what yeah. I mean? Anyone, anyone that invests, they. I don't know. I don't think they care. No, but so like that that puts the onus on the people creating these platforms to make it difficult to take this type of advantage of their platform. Like if they if they preach the idea of central decentralization, then make an ICO that forces decentralization. Don't allow three people to buy up seventy five percent of your entire ICO in in fifteen yeah, seconds. Man. That was bullshit. Right, thirty that's, seconds. That's not decentralization. That's that's the very opposite. The of exact this. opposite of it. It's people taking advantage of your platform to make a shitload of money. Don't care about what you're doing. And so, like, we're gonna keep doing this, right, until people change the way they're doing things. We can preach about it all we want in terms of the ideology of what we're trying to do, but at the end of the day. If the people who are making these platforms and selling tokens don't make it hard for investors to take advantage of their platform, then we're going to run ourselves into the ground real fast. Or just hold your Bitcoin and watch. I mean, that's... <laughs> <laughs> so where all this started was the concept of a bubble. Yeah. <laughs> You want, to, you want to give us some some outlines? Market bubble, price bubble, financial bubble, spe- speculative mania, or balloon. The trade in an asset at a price or price range that strongly exceeds the asset's intrinsic value. See, that in and of itself is like kind of meh. Because it's like, who? who how do you calculate the intrinsic value of a thing? Well, what's the use? I mean, what's the, per- what's the point? What, what, why do you own the thing? So, like, if you for a real natural supply and demand is relative to, I need that thing to do what I want to do, and not I need that thing so I can sell it back to somebody else for twice as much. So mm-hmm. the the baseline for supply and demand is based on I need this thing for the utility of the thing. If we're talking about Ethereum, I need this thing because I need to pay for contract execution. I want to pay for someone to run these smart contracts so that I can do whatever utility these smart contracts provide. Not because I'm trying to hold value or hold on to it for a long period of time to, to make myself rich. That's the whole so idea. Getting people to see that they need these tokens. Ooh, that's going to be a hard sell. Mm-hmm. And that's where we find ourselves. Especially on the ICOs that don't have a use case for their token. They're just like, we're just crowd selling because we want to make a lot of money. Yeah, that that stuff is, you can see straight through that stuff. Hopefully. But if you want to take your chances, you should come on TBP announcements and announce your ICO. <laughs> I'll give you, um, I'll give you, I'll give you a fair question. Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> every, it doubles every time we have a new one. Every time we have a new one, it doubles, yeah. Anyways. That's enough. Well, I, I think mean, we should wrap it up. It's, yeah, it's... yeah, let's wrap it up. So if you guys, you should think about the concept of a bubble because um, if you ever get into a situation where people are wearing lots of suits and ties and Bitcoin comes up, the one of those people is going to say, it, looks, it just looks like it's experiencing a bubble. And it's going to be up to you to say, like, well, wait a second. Let's talk about this concept of a bubble. Before every other suit and tie is like, oh, yeah, it's a bubble. That's what it is. I just kind of simulated that experience for you. If that ever happens for you, probably won't. But, you know, it exists. Anyways, so let's wrap this shit up. So we got at the BTC podcast. It's on Twitter. Teller runs the Twitter. Tweet to him. He'll tweet back. Uh, the Bitcoin podcast.com, of course. Uh, the Ethereum podcast.com. And the blockchain podcast.net. 
the blockchain podcast.com, the ethereum podcast.org. The they all come to us. Info. They all come to us. Every one of them. Because we're savvy. We're squatting on them, Love bitches. It. Or ours. We're squatting on the URLs now. We got like six of them. Go for it. Take your chances. Um, let's see here. Uh, if you want to sign up for the newsletter, go to the website. There's a little tab on there that says newsletter. That's where you go to sign up for the newsletter. Um, let's see here. What else do we do? Corey writes these amazing ICO analyses. Whenever there's one of these ICOs, he does math, and then he shows you how many people bought how much at what times. This weekend, I'll, right. I'll, be, I'll be publishing the basic attention token that sold yeah, out. The did you say an analyses? Analyses? Yes. That's analyses? The plural of analysis. I'm, I'm constantly surrounded by people that say analysis is. So yeah, they're, they're way they're funny. wrong. <laughs> they're way wrong. Analysis. Okay. I feel like analysis. Analysis. analysis would even be better. I don't know the correct answer, but it's not analysis. It's definitely not analysis. It's definitely not, not a, that. Analysis. Um, okay. I hope it is. I hope it is. If if it is, please someone correct me so I can yeah. I can feel bad about myself. It's but it's definitely not analysis. No, I'm wrong. Analysis. Um, what else do we do? Um, Find us on the Slack. Slack, of course. If you go to the BitcoinPodcast.com or the EtheriumPodcast.com, EtheriumPodcast.net, you can catch it. Slack have, and not say anything, and then become inactive a month later. Yeah, we have Why 137 have? members as of right now, and I'd say maybe 10, 10 people talk regularly. Yeah, one guy continue. literally said, "I thought there'd be more people in here." After joining for like a minute, like it was supposed to be a constant party for him. I don't understand. Well, the yeah, thing is, is that like our our Slack, like, you're not going to make money off our Slack, right? You're not going to be a wall crawler and learn a lot of inside tidbits of what's going on in the space. You're going to see a lot of gangster rap and conjecture. <laughs> yeah, like that's it's, about all. It's that literally we- a community of people who come here to have fun. So if that's what you want. Yeah. Or if you have questions, we got Slack channels for questions. Yeah, there's there's channels over there that do different things. But if you hop in the Slack and think you're just going to soak up a bunch of knowledge and get some insider Bitcoin info, you're absolutely wrong. Like that's not how we do things. So, anyways, um, what else do we do? The blog. Ken has his show, Bitcoin Talk, where he talks about Bitcoin, and Bitcoin accessories. You can find him on YouTube. Uh, you search for Ken Bosak, Bosak. That's K E N N B O S A K. Um, and we're also going to be releasing his audio on our feed, so look out for that. He does interviews called "Not Another Bitcoin Interview," where it's supposed to be not another Bitcoin interview, but it actually is a Bitcoin. Interview. So there's irony built in. <laughs> anyway, uh, state change and state change. State Eat change is going to be. An Ether review and wait a second. Yeah, let's just fill the audience in. Okay, so as you guys probably know, we're building out this network of shows. Currently, we have TBP on Ramp with D, TBP announcements, Ether review, state change, Bitcoin talk. Uh, we're also going to be releasing an audio version of Week in Ethereum. We, of course, we have Block Channel, and Corey is thinking of a special show, a monthly special show, where he talks about data science. Yeah, buddy. Because everyone loves data science. Well, data science so there's a few of us. There's a few of us that love it. There's a few of you guys that love that. And it is um, wholly lacking. So, yeah, we do a lot of things. We're going to wrap this up for you guys. Thanks for listening again. Um, shout out to Zoe Saldana. Shout out to Viola Davis, of course. Um, so I need to share, spread the love around. Gosh. Shout out to Charlize Theron, girl. All right, well, I'm about to I'm about to tweet Zoe Saldana to say we've shouted her out at least 130 times. Yeah, definitely do that. Make sure you tag me in there. Oh, don't worry, a lot. I got you, bro. Don't worry. Say some stuff about love. All right. Um. Well, play. Yeah.
Let's just qu- we can just close it out. Call it a day. Yeah, we'll close it out. We'll call it a day. Good interview. Should right. really? What do you want to talk about? What you say, Corey? What's up, well, I just I just feel like we ha- I just feel like we waited 15 minutes for you to finish your dishes. We should at least use that time wisely and talk <laughs> <Okay>. about something. <laughs> All right. Well, then it's not 15 minutes. You guys for your dishes to just up. close out the episode. It was not that long. We'll we'll talk about the concept of <laughs> in ten. Wait, where's your brother at? Get your brother on. Let's no let's hear let's hear like 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 a, a mad black it. man's view of Coinbase. Scared man. Him and his wife, they're scared to get on a podcast. I don't want to put their voice out there. Oh. It's so because you're so like you you prepare yourself so much to get on these podcasts that I'm sure they're like they're really scared about that. Yeah, it's, they see how hard I prepare. <laughs> He's making progress, though. No more pre-show dumps. Oh, he still does them. He just doesn't tell us about them. <laughs> yeah, those, those still happen. The pre-show dumps. He doesn't happen. get on. He doesn't wake up yeah. 15 minutes late, drink a cup of coffee, and say, I gotta take a dump. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Alright, let's get started. We are recording this whole time. I remember I've been recording this That's all the whole time. The whole reason why we do it on Friday nights. <laughs> Is because of pre-show dump avoidance. It's pretty much pretty much why we do Friday nights now yeah. to avoid the pre-show dump. Yeah. I'm gonna put that at the end. So all this is going. On. All right. Uh, um, oh, can I just say I was I was at Schlotsky's eating lunch and I was listening to one of our episodes, and that fucking uh, uh, take me on screwed and chopped came on and I laughed by myself at the table out loud. <laughs> <laughs> that shit was so funny. <laughs> Did you not think I was going to do it? I told you I was going to do it. I just wasn't expecting it. <laughs> Don't we roll? All right. The great thing about doing that is because if anybody tries to come at us crooked, we can say it was a parody. So, fuck yeah, off. Yeah. Luckily, no one's come at us crooked for all the dumb shit we've done so far. That's because we're oh, earnest yeah. people, man. That's why we get away with dumb shit. It's because we're earnest. Yeah. Anyway, one day when we're um, like when we're superstars, it won't be so won't be so true. Yeah. We'll have to be. Yeah, I'm probably not going to use Radiohead as our intro for 50 episodes. Yeah, I like how we skirted <laughs> around that. Somebody was like, "Yeah, no, that was you, Corey." You were like, "That's Radiohead," and we were like, mm, "You sure?" No. <laughs> I didn't know it was Radiohead. No uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> Oh, anyways. All right, let's get started. In 10.